original super fun and all about artisan cheese and more to melt your peaceful heart and toast your peaceful life. Coming to you from the Appalachian Mountains of southwestern Virginia, this is the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hey, this is Scott Hall from Peaceful Heart Farm, and you are listening to the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hello, everybody. Melanie Hall here. I hope you are doing very, very well. The conversation today and every day revolves around the value of tradition. Traditional living, traditional food prep and storage, traditional cooking, and of course, traditional raw milk products and artisan cheese. Topics discussed here are designed to create new perspectives and possibilities for how you might add the taste of tradition to your life. You can make your own cheese part two. All right. In the last podcast, I introduced this idea of making your own cheese. And I talked about what you would need regarding equipment and pots and vats and milk storage forms and molds and other supplies, cheese, cloths, mats, some weights and presses, and then miscellaneous stuff like measuring cups and cheese waxing setups, if you're going to do that. And I'll leave a link in the show notes so you can check that episode out if you haven't heard it yet. Today's episode is going to complete that topic. As always, welcome new listeners and welcome back veteran homestead loving regulars. Thank you for stopping by the Farmcast for every episode. I appreciate you all so, so much. And I'm so excited to share with you what's going on at the farm this week. There's a lot. And today's recipe is going to be lemon cheese. That's a reprise. But it's appropriate for today's topic. All right, Homestead Life Updates. Uh, At the top of the list of Homestead Updates is a bit of bad news and some good news. Last time we were together, I talked about Claire, our matriarch cow, getting closer and closer to her due date, which is the end of March. Unfortunately, Violet came up first, and I say unfortunately because she spontaneously aborted more than a month before her due date. Uh, We lost that calf. It always saddens me when nature deals us harsh reality, but there is good news also. Violet's okay. Uh, She was treated for a uterine infection, and she'll recover without issue as far as we know. And she's in milk, and that's a very great thing. I have been missing milk for quite a while and hadn't expected to get any for another month. And I'm sure her cheer customers are missing it also. Cheese making will ramp up once we have a few more calves born and more milk in the tank. One other side note, this morning when we milked her, Violet had very little milk. We have surmised that Cloud's little Luna is double dipping. Uh, We separated Luna and Cloud from the rest of the herd, and we put butter in with them so they have lots of companionship. Uh, So the expectation is that Violet's milk production will be up to speed this evening because Luna doesn't have access to her. Uh, We still won't have milk right away. Always when we have a great need to use antibiotics and other medications, there's a period of time when the milk is not acceptable for human consumption. But soon, very soon, we will have milk. Now, the neighbor called a few days ago to let us know that the sheep were out on the road. Sigh, big sigh, a gate left open again. It happens. And now, thank goodness that the goats didn't follow their lead. The goats are much harder to get back inside the fence. The sheep, you just kind of walk at them, and they ran down the hill and ran right back inside the fence. In other sheep news, we had an unexpected birth a few weeks ago. That mishap came about because uh, about six months ago at this point, we were moving the various groups of animals from one place to another, and somehow... One of the rams ended up with the ewes. We discovered it about two weeks later, and we rectified the situation. However, we thought it likely that at least one or more would have come into heat during that two weeks' time. I'm surprised it was only one unauthorized breeding. The rest of the flock is still on schedule to begin delivering the first week of May. Yesterday, we rounded up all the goat and sheep girls for a health check. 
basically we're, we're looking for signs of worms. Both sheep and goats can be devastated by a type of worm that literally sucks the blood out of them. Uh, and we keep an eye on this and breed for resistance to these worms. We even planned on doing a prophylactic dose of worming because when their hormone, hormones begin ramping up as they approach birthing and, and when the weather becomes warmer and wet, the worms take off and they can take over. So we watched closely. They looked great. We didn't worm any of them. I, I take that back. We wormed the new baby as a precaution. They simply cannot tolerate the worms and will be gone in a matter of days if they get infected. So worming is necessary. It's a necessary intervention in, in caring for these animals. Back in 2010, 2011, uh, we lost a lot of lambs. And then we altered our grazing practices and surrendered to the need for chemical intervention at times. Um, after we got the hang of it, we have only had to worm once a year, if at all. Some years, like this year as an example, they may not be wormed at all. Though we still, we do still check on them from time to time throughout the summer season, especially the lambs. Again, they are particularly vulnerable. Quail, still not laying. I don't have much to say about that. I keep telling them if they don't start laying, they're going to end up in the instant pot. I have a great Instant Pot quail recipe. Mm. That's an empty threat, and evidently they know it as they're not responding. Scott is off getting one of our portable milkers serviced. We are completely replacing the hoses. It's a regular maintenance task for ensuring we get the cleanest milk possible. Uh, milk calcium builds up in the hoses, and it can harbor bacteria. So the hoses are completely replaced at regular intervals. Now, because he's off on this task, Scott is not working on the creamery today, but he has done so much recently. All of the doors and windows are hung. He even created these really great window sills. Go to our farm page on Facebook and look at the pictures. They are an original creation and so awesome. The door handles and locks come next, but maybe not. The milking parlor and barn portion of the building still need a roof. Now, this roof will be really tall and supported by giant posts. It'll be like a pole barn. Fresh air will circulate freely. I love the openness, openness of this design. It's a, it's a New Zealand design that we picked up from another uh, dairy farmer, cheesemaker as it happens, in, in, in the area. We are starting into the fourth year of putting this building together. Uh, it, it's a long journey, but well worth the effort. And I want to mention to those of you who are listening and dreaming of your own homestead, just keep taking small steps. Keep putting one foot in front of the other. The dream lives in your mind and each step you take brings a little bit more of it into reality. We bought this property as a bare piece of land in September 2003. We were weekend homesteaders until December 2016. That's 13 years. And we did a lot in those 13 years. And we had the advantage of savoring every small accomplishment. There's something to be said for learning and growing at a slower pace. Gradually building the skills necessary for success. And we tried a lot of different things on a very small scale. And for us, it was the way forward to realizing our lifelong dream. Now let's get to the topic of the day, finishing up the discussion on what steps are needed to successfully make your own cheese at home. Now, as I said earlier, I gave you the basics of physical stuff you'll need. Now I need to talk about what the space looks like in which you'll use this stuff and how do you properly clean everything. Cleanliness is of utmost importance when making cheese. The cheese making process is one of biological reactions. You will want to ensure that only those cultures, bacteria, viruses, molds, yeasts, only the ones you choose end up in your cheese. All right. Now, as far as creating your cheese making space, for most of you, this is going to be your family kitchen. And here are some things to take into consideration for your cheese making area. Storage space for pots and forms and a press. Adequate counter space. A hot water source for warming milk and for cleanup. 
a place to hang or set your draining cheeses and your cheese press. An area away from pets, dust sources, any stored chemicals and cleaning products. You'll want a proper ambient room temperature. You'll need a place to store cultures and your coagulants properly. And you'll likely need an aging fridge located somewhere where it's convenient to check daily. That's important. Now let's cover them one by one. Storage space. So you're going to need a good size storage space for several large stainless steel pots, right? We talked about that last time, the, the pots that you would have. You're going to have cheese forms and or molds and you got miscellaneous equipment such as ladles, spoons, probably at least one countertop cheese press. So Choose a location that doesn't share a space with any cleaning products or chemicals or pet or animal products, including brushes and medications. You don't want it near human medications or compost or trash bins or any other product or equipment that could dirty or contaminate your equipment. I have a dedicated space to all things cheese. I even duplicated some piece of equipment that I use for normal day-to-day -day cooking activities. It makes my cleaning and sanitation steps easier and more effective. It's like this only gets used for cheese and it's, it's in this space right here. Now, as far as adequate counter space, it seems like it might be an easy one, but counter space is probably at a premium in your household. I know it is in mine and you may think it's going to be easy to clear space on the days you make cheese and it's, it's likely your only option as it is mine. But remember, you may be occupying that space for a day or more. How will it affect your family meals? Can you keep the space sanitary? Is there a way to protect the space from the splashing of dishwater or splatters from cooking pots and pans during, during the time that you're in there making your cheese? So just keep that in mind. A hot water source. You'll likely be warming your cheese using hot water. Usually it's a double boiler type setup on your stovetop or in a sink. Personally, I use the sink, but your stovetop or a hot plate are just as useful. Now, I confiscate all access to the sink for the period of time I will be cooking the cheese. Some cheese requires temperatures over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and the hot water from the sink may not reach adequate temperatures. That's when you'll need that stovetop or hot plate double boiler setup. Standard water heaters top out at about 118 degrees Fahrenheit. I have one cheese that I make that gets heated up to 126, and the outside temperature has got to be higher than that uh, to bring it up to that temperature. We have a special setting on our hot water heater that I can bring it up to 140, so I can still use that. But you likely are going to need to have a, a stovetop set up with a double boiler set up, a big pot with another pot inside of it with water, uh, a big pot with water and another pot inside of it to make like a double boiler that you can literally heat up on the stove. Now also be aware that if you're using the same sink, sink for cleaning equipment, I'm back to the sink now. I'm off the stovetop. We're back in the sink. You can run into some problems when you're trying to keep wash water out of your cheese pot. I deal with this all the time. Um, I'm extra careful and I use a lid on the cheese pot because generally if I'm cleaning something in the other sink, then my cheese is in a sitting phase. And so I just cover it. I have a lid up for my cheese pot. And that frees my second sink for cleaning up or at least rinsing the visible, visible milk from measuring cups and utensils and, and so on. All right, so that's hot water and a little bit about cleaning. But draining space, You'll, you're going to need a space to hang your draining curd if it's a soft, uh, fresh cheese, and a place to set your cheeses that drain in forms or in a press. So small amounts of curd, they can be bag drained by suspending the bag from Maybe a utensil that's placed across the top of a tall pot. And I don't really have a tall pot. Larger volumes need some things like a, a hook mount, mounted under a, a cabinet, something of good, strong quality. This is what I do. I place, I use the door handles on my cabinet to hang my cheese with a string. I just wrap that string around the door handle instead of being having a hook up underneath it. I place a bowl under the bag to catch the whey. 
maybe someday I'll get that mounted hook. But but then again, I have much more freedom with how high I can raise the cheese for draining. I'm not limited to the hook under the cabinet and having to have space for that hook. I can bring the bag right up to the bottom of the of the of the cabinet. So if I have a larger cheese there. Now, if you're draining your cheese in a form, you need a surface with either a slight slope that's going to drain into the sink or a or, or your container, or you're going to need a level kind of perforated or grooved surface that's that if it's flat, then it's going to collect down in the grooves and, and wick away and, and divert the draining way. If your cheeses don't need any weights for pressing, you can use a sloped surface such as a dish rack or a drain board, and it works great. But if you're stacking forms or adding weights uh, to the top, a surface with with too much slope will cause the the stacked forms to tip and they're gonna they're gonna topple over. I have even on a flat surface I have problems sometimes keeping my stuff from toppling over when I'm stacking molds or stacking more weights on top of them. So with my preferred method is a cooling rack over like a half a baker's sheet. So I've got the rack and then I put my mold on top of that and then the way can go down into the half baker sheet. Uh, below the rack and this that works fine for lighter weight forms but it's not going to support too much weight without collapsing the rack so you can still use the same system but with more weight you can place like a large plastic cutting board over the rack and then put a cheese mat on top of that and that gives you a little bit of space to wick that way away from the form or mold one other thing that I do a lot of times is I'll take like a a metal ring, a metal canning ring, and put it right in the middle up underneath that cooling rack, and that'll keep that rack from collapsing in the middle. So those are a couple of ideas of, of how I set up space on my countertop, just, you know, the space of a half baker sheet on, to, on top of the counter. Some of them I can even use smaller things, and I can drain them actually in the sink. That gets a little more dangerous when you have a lot of people in your kitchen that can come in there and accidentally mess your cheese up if it's in the sink. But anyway, those are some ideas. Now, let me talk about pets, dust sources, stored chemicals, cleaning products, all that kind of stuff I mentioned before. So you want to be sure that you're going to store your equipment away from hazards such as those cleaning products and medications. And you also want to limit access to your working space by pets or other critters Think about things like windows that open to animal pens or dusty driveways. If these are in your workspace, do your best to keep them closed during cheese making time. Even a window that opens to a lovely forest will allow mold spores to enter the milk. And while they may not cause health issues, they will cause flavor flaws and more. Your cheese may not taste anything like you thought it was going to. Remember, it's essential that you control what microscopic flavoring goes into your cheese. Now, since you're like, your workplace is likely going to be in the family kitchen, <clears throat> there are other natural hazards that will exist. When you, you've got shared products, you've got drain opener, oven cleaner, and so on. I mean, what are other household members doing during the time that your cheese making is in progress? Even if the cleaners are completely organic, secure them from unintentional contact during cheese making. You don't want a lot of dusting and vacuuming and household cleaning products being sprayed into the air during the time that you're making cheese. And don't make yeast bread while you're making cheese. Uh, don't let somebody else be making yeast bread while you're making cheese. Anyway, let's talk about the room temperature. The ideal temperature during making and draining is 70 to 72 degrees Fahrenheit. And ideally, your space will be climate controlled. It's not usually a problem if you're in the U.S. Other countries are not so liberal in their use of air conditioning. And you will need to take this into consideration when making cheese if you're in that situation. Uh, let's see. Storage for cultures and your coagulants. You, you'll be using these freeze-dried direct set cultures for your cheeses. They're the most convenient and reliable. Um, and these types of cultures are best stored in the freezer. Rennet or other coagulants, those are going to be stored in the refrigerator. Cultures in the freezer, rennet in the refrigerator. 
There's no concern over storing this alongside your bottles of ketchup and mayo. You know, sharing the family fridge is not a problem for your rennet. It is light sensitive though, so don't stand there with your door open on your refrigerator. Mine dings and alarms me anyway if I have the door open for too long. But you can also, you can actually wrap up your bottle of rennet like in foil or something to keep the light out of it if you're concerned about that at all. Now, last item, your cheese aging unit location. Now, if you'll be aging cheeses and almost every cheese maker will eventually give it a try, you're going to have an aging unit. We started off with a wine storage fridge. It works great. Try to find it's try to find a convenient location that is in sight daily and easily accessed because out of sight, out of mind with your cheeses, you need to be checking, turning your cheeses daily, weekly, whatever, depending on what cheese you have in there. All right, now that about covers our space needs. Now let's go on to cleanliness. Uh, when when you're making cheese for yourself or to share, you'll want to create an excellent product, right? Better than anything you could get at the grocery store. And no matter how well you can make a recipe, if your equipment isn't clean, your cheese will be tainted as well. And uh, that's why I'm devoting an entire segment to this uh, topic. I mean, it just, it's so important. Cleanliness in cheese making is absolutely important. So let's talk about the chemicals first. Well, you you might associate the term chemical with something man-made and harmful. Remember that everything in life is made of chemical compounds. So even so-called natural cleaners are composed of chemicals. Uh, but more than likely, they are naturally occurring compounds. Remember that naturally occurring chemicals can still be harmful. Keep safety in mind at all times. Cleaning and sanitizing products works well to remove residue from surface, surfaces. Th- this is accomplished from... Uh, they have harsh and caustic characteristics, right? So it's not something you want on your skin, in your eyes, or in your lungs. Have you read the warning labels lately? Do you have good air circulation and ventilation? Gloves and goggles are a plus. Your prescription glasses can uh, work in place of goggles, but beware of ruining the special coatings on the lenses. Um, So go with goggles if you splash a lot. I use gloves, not so much with the the goggles at this point although I have ruined glasses <laughs> so there are basically three categories of chemicals that are needed for proper cleaning of your cheese space and the equipment you'll need detergents for cleaning sanitizers for sanitizing and acids for removing calcium deposits and also additional sanitizing sometimes the uh, categories are combined in one product or another Therefore, overlap in their usage can be confusing. For example, chlorine, a commonly used and readily available sanitizer, is often combined with detergent as it has the ability to help with removal of proteins during cleaning. And acids can also be used to sanitize. So I'll provide some steps later that can help clarify which is used when and kind of how you combine them sometimes. Now let's talk about uh, detergents first. When it comes to cleaning, uh, detergents are quite dependent on water temperature, pH, and mechanical action. In other words, you'll need hot water and physical exertion to do the job. Detergents by nature are alkaline with a pH above 7.0. And you can buy fancy dairy detergent and it will have chlorine in it. But for most home situations, a name brand or store brand detergent, Ajax, Dawn, whatever your favorite palm olive, palm olive, whatever, and though those will all work just fine as a detergent. It's what I use. Now, unscented is best, but sometimes it's a little bit harder to find. Uh, all right, sanitizers. Now, sanitizers are used to eliminate any bacteria that scrubbing and washing might not have removed. But the thorough cleaning must come first, right? There's an old saying, you can't sanitize something that isn't clean. Sanitizing can be done with chemicals, both those that break down into very environmentally friendly components and those that don't. Or you can sanitize using heat. We don't usually use that so much in cheese making. The most readily available sanitizer to use at home is chlorine. 
Chlorine in the form of grocery store bleach is very effective, easy to find, and expensive. Quite often, however, people use too much, leading to sanitizer residue on equipment, which can harm your cheese and produce undesirable flavors. And other issues include uh, corrosion of stainless steel and other metal surfaces and even harm to septic and wastewater systems. You may need as little as a half teaspoon to one teaspoon per gallon of water to reach the ideal of 50 to 100 parts per million. And now there is an inexpensive chlorine dilution, dilution test strip that can be ordered online and using the strips periodically will guarantee that the proper amount of sanitizer is being used. You don't want too much, but you also don't want too little. And chlorine can lose its effectiveness over time. Or you might be using more a more concentrated so, solution. So measure for consistent results. You're going to use sanitizer solution on your equipment just before use. With cheese brushes, you're going to soak them and then air dry them before you use them. When Also, when it's mixed properly, that 50 to 100 uh, parts per, per million, you do not need to rinse that chlorine solution with plain water. A cloth dipped in the mix solution can be used to wipe down surfaces and other areas that come in contact with your equipment. So all of this sanitizing just before use. All right. Now the acid rinses. Uh, the acid plays two roles. First, it's a solvent of mineral deposits. And second, it's kind of a residual sanitizer. You only need to use it periodically to prevent the buildup of what is commonly called milkstone. Milkstone builds up slowly as the minerals in the milk are steadily deposited on the surfaces. While most are rinsed away during cleaning, they are not all dissolved by the alkaline detergents and they'll eventually form a residue on all surfaces, including plastic and stainless steel. So the goal is to remove the minerals before you see the buildup by rinsing regularly with a strong acid solution. All right, so they, like the alkaline doesn't get them all. You need to hit it with that acid ever so often. Now, if you drink coffee, you might have periodically run a vinegar solution through your coffee maker. Same thing. It breaks up those mineral deposits. Now, the strength of that acid and the frequency of the rinse will depend on the amount of use your equipment receives, as well as the hardness of your water. So I can't give you really any guidelines there. Hard water has a higher mineral content. It's going to contribute to the buildup. Softer water and minimal use, you may be able to use white vinegar for your rinse. I actually can use white vinegar if I do it like every single time. If I let it build up, white vinegar doesn't work as well and I need a stronger acid. But now if this is not sufficient, as I said, then you want you want an acid cleaner approved for use on stainless steel and any other material that you're cleaning. Now, cleaning your brushes and scrubbers. You can use pretty much any kind of scrub brush and scrubber. Sponges are not recommended. They are perfect habitats for bacteria. And be aware that if you're using a green scrub pad, watch for the little green hairs on forms and equipment. This isn't a food safety issue, but it isn't pleasant to find them in your cheese. Been there, done that. I watch closely. Uh, to make sure I don't leave behind any little green pieces from my scrub pads. All right, so that's, uh, those are the three areas, the detergent, the sanitizer, the acid rinse, and a, and a little extra on your brushes and scrub scrubbers, keeping those sanitary and watching for problems with those. Now, let me just briefly cover six steps to sparkling clean cheese making. A good cleaning regimen is going to have at least four steps. You're going to rinse, pre-rinse, right? You're going to wash, then there'll be an acid rinse, and then before you use, the, there's a pre-sanitize. Now, they're important for creating the best possible cheese. Now, and I'm going to give you a few procedures that are fairly typical for, mo for most situations, and you'll be able to alter these somewhat according to your circumstances. But number one, there's the pre-rinse. 
Immediately after using, rinse all equipment with lukewarm water, 100 degrees Fahrenheit. You want to remove visible, visible milk and any curd residues. Um, this step is important to do before washing so the heat of the wash water doesn't like cook the proteins onto the surface. All right, so step two is the wash. And then you're going to use very hot water and your detergent product to clean all your surfaces. Use a clean bristle brush and a scrub pads to scour all of your utensils and equipment. Step three, rinse with clean water. Now, if you're using a periodic sanitizing acid rinse, you can use it at this stage. Then step four, allow all equipment to air dry between uses. So those are your four basic steps. Additionally, sanitizing just prior to use, sanitize all equipment by you're going to dip it in a food surface approved sanitizer that includes chlorine, as I talked about earlier. And your sanitizer, you're dipping it in there. It needs 30 seconds of exposure to ensure proper killing of any residual uh, germs. Now, let me talk a little bit more about the acid wash separate from just where I had included it with step three with the rinse. An acid wash done on a periodic basis to remove mineral deposits that are not completely removed during the daily cleaning process is what we're talking about. Some acid wash products include cleaners to help with this step. An acid rinse without cleaners can be done on a daily basis, as I was saying about using the white vinegar, instead of the stronger periodic acid wash that may contain the detergent. If you choose to do the daily acid rinse, you can perform it either just following or in place of step three, as I talked about. If you're doing periodic acid washes, the frequency will depend on the amount of calcium or other minerals in your water, as well as the frequency of use for cheese making. So observe your equipment, especially when it is dry. You're looking for haziness and colors that might indicate the need for stronger cleaning, both through scrubbing by hand and with chemicals. And one other note, this is going to be the last I'm going to talk about cleaning, using automatic dishwashers. As an alternative to hand washing, you can effectively clean equipment by using an automatic dishwasher. Um, and then you pick up with step three to complete your cleaning process. Rinse with clean water or acid sanitizing, rinse, air dry, sanitize just prior to use. All right? So that's it. The problem I have with the dishwasher, I just have to put that, is my equipment, the pots and stuff, they don't fit in there. They're just too big. But some of the smaller things, I do run them through my dishwasher cycle instead of hand washing them. That's it. You're ready to make cheese now. And a reminder, again, this stuff I will have, uh, hopefully, quickly, some PDF versions of this. So you can download them and, and run through these steps and, and get your uh, cheese making set up going. Let's talk about today's recipe, lemon cheese. I'm going to reprise this recipe that I did uh, last year for lemon cheese. It's appropriate now that you have all the steps in place for making your own cheese at home. Lemon cheese is a very simple fresh cheese that you can easily make in your kitchen. It is a moist spreadable cheese with a hint of lemon taste. If you make it in the evening, this rich and delicious cheese will be ready to spread on hot biscuits, toast, muffins, bagels, or croissants for breakfast in the morning. What you're going to need, you're going to need a gallon of milk. Do not use ultra pasteurized. It will not set up properly. You'll need two large lemons or a quarter cup of lemon juice and a quarter teaspoon of salt. Real simple, what you need to do, warm it up to 165 degrees, stirring often to prevent scorching. This gets heated directly on the stove. This is not using the double boiler or in your, uh, you can use the double boiler with this, but you're not going to get 165 degrees in your sink. Let me just say that. So it's on the stove. All right. Once you reach 165 degrees, add your lemon juice, stir it in really well, and then set it aside for 15 minutes. That warm milk will separate into a stringy curd and it'll be like a greenish liquid whey. And it should be clear, not milky, but it'll be greenish. Line a colander with butter muslin 
get a good quality butter muslin from uh, a cheese making supply company, not cheesecloth that you buy in the grocery store. You can also use an old t-shirt material will work as well. Anyway, pour the curds and the whey into the colander and then you're going to tie the corners of the cheesecloth into a knot and hang the bag of curds to drain. After an hour, check for the desired consistency. Think cream cheese. You want it a little bit spreadable. You want it a lot spreadable, actually. Then you're going to remove it from the cloth and place it in a bowl. Add salt to taste. Usually that quarter teaspoon will do it. You can even mix in herbs like fresh dill. And then you're going to place that cheese in a covered container and store it in the refrigerator. It'll keep for about a week, maybe even a little more. You can also, uh, just a couple of notes, you can go up to 190 degrees to help your milk coagulate. And you can add more lemon juice if your milk doesn't coagulate in that 15 minutes. All right, your homemade cheese is a success. All right, final thoughts. That's it for today's podcast. I hope you enjoyed the homestead updates. And if you already heard Sherry Orner, well, I guess you know that fresh milk and yogurt is coming soon. We'll keep you updated on when and where to pick up. Remember, there's a transcript of this podcast, the previous podcast available on our website. I'm also working on that PDF version that will be available for download for your use in reviewing the steps and getting your home cheese making setup and procedures in order. Once you got it in order, you're going to be able to make that lemon cheese. If you enjoyed this podcast, please hop over to Apple Podcasts, subscribe, give me a five-star rating and review. Also, please share it with any friends or family who might be interested in this type of content. That is absolutely the best way to help this podcast grow. As always, I'm here to help you taste the traditional touch. Thank you so much for stopping by the homestead. And until next time, may God fill your life with grace and peace.